Welcome back and welcome to section two, dependency management. In this section, we will demonstrate how to correctly manage external dependencies in Java through the use of Maven and Gradle. Welcome to video one. What is a dependency and why does it need managing? In this video, as the title suggests, we're going to understand what a project dependency is and why we need to manage it, particularly for large and complex projects. So what is a dependency? Well, so far, all of our examples have been built using the core Java programming language. And we've basically just been making use of built-in features, functions, and data types. String, in, long, list, map, set, all of those things that we've talked about and seen working examples of. Now, of course, Java is a fully featured language. But what if we want to perform a common task that's not built into the language? For example, let's say we have a CSV file that contains some information about cars and we want to parse it and we want to write the results out to another CSV file. Now, of course, we could write our own code for that. Java features things to read from the file system. There are libraries built into the Java language to read files from the file system. We know how to handle strings. There is a string.split method. We could split our string on the comma, on the comma field. We could also split on the new line, uh, on the new line character. And we could write our own CSV parser if we wanted to. But if we take a step back and think about this, how many other programmers do you think have come across this problem? They have a CSV file and they want to parse it as efficiently as possible. Well, the answer is probably in the millions. So instead of writing our own code for this task, wouldn't it be better to use a common framework? Now, this common framework has probably been used by hundreds of thousands or millions of other developers. Those developers have already found most of the bugs that there are to find in it. It's already been optimized for performance and reliability. It's been tested thoroughly, probably in production millions or billions of times. It's managed by the community probably, if we can find such a library, and I assure you we can. That's far better than us writing something ourselves that we have to maintain and test and make sure is working. And this framework is a third-party dependency. And actually, it's quite common for projects to end up with a really large number of dependencies. The Java ecosystem is absolutely enormous, and there are libraries out there for performing almost any task that you can imagine. Everything from simplifying the processing of a file through to libraries to help you with multi-threading, libraries to help you with database connection pooling. Now, connecting to a database is actually usually the most expensive or time, time expensive part of running a query. So if you have a web server that's running lots of queries against your database, it's very common to pre-warm or pre-connect, say, 10 times and keep what's known as a pool of warm connections that you share as your web server gets hit instead of connecting each time, which is really inefficient. There are software development kits for lots of well-known APIs, such as Facebook, Google, and Amazon. There are JSON processes, and we're going to see an example of that a little bit later. There are XML processes. There are serialization and deserialization frameworks. There are SDKs for SDKs, software development kit, for popular databases like Elasticsearch and MongoDB. And really, the list goes on. And on top of that, there are also large frameworks aimed, aimed at solving multitudes of common tasks. So one good example of this is the Apache Commons library, which we're going to use a bit later. Apache Commons is a little bit like a builder's toolkit. It contains lots of little libraries that do lots of, lots of small things that you need to do a lot really, really well, such as parsing and processing and writing CSV files. And perhaps the most or best well-known uh, library is called the Spring Framework. And the Spring Framework is essentially an enormous library that features a whole ton of the things that we've just talked about, like database connection pools, web servers. Its core purpose is for dependency injection. Uh, dependency injection is outside of the scope of this course. Um, but it's, it's a very fully featured Java framework that is basically designed to be config-driven so you can you write your config for it and it can go off and spin up a web server for you without you really having to write too much code at all. 
So imagine we have a dependency landscape that looks like this. We've got our Apache Commons library, which I talked about. We've got Mockito, which is a testing framework, which is used for mocking out dependencies. So for example, if you're testing something that relied on a database, Mockito allows you to pretend you have a database connection when you don't and tell it what responses to give back. We've got Logback, which is a logging framework. We've got the Google SDK for interacting with Google APIs, think maps, weather, machine learning, that kind of thing. We've got JUnit, which is a very common unit testing framework. We've got ReactiveX down here, uh, which is a way of writing asynchronous responsive Java code. So it looks a little bit like JavaScript, and it's really, really helpful for, uh, for processing uh, large streams of data. We've got Hibernate, which is uh, an object relational mapper for a database. So essentially it allows you to persist your, your objects directly to a database without writing SQL. We've got the Facebook SDK for interacting with Facebook functions. We've got JSON libraries for parsing and processing JSON files. And we're going to look at an example of that later. And we've got the Spring Framework as well. And the question is, how do we manage all of these dependencies? Is it really a good idea for me to go to Apache Commons, download the zip and import it into my project, go to Mokito, download the zip and import it into my project, and do that for all of these different dependencies? Well, the answer is, is no. So imagine you've got a large application with 10 plus dependencies. And this might sound crazy, but uh, believe me, 10 dependencies is quite a small number for an application. I've seen applications with, with 50 plus external dependencies, including ones uh, that are written by the project team themselves. Now, each dependency also has its own version, and your application will probably depend on a specific version of each one. Now, it might not depend on a three-digit version, but it will probably depend on a major version, given that between major versions, there are probably breaking interface changes. Imagine you also have three developers working on the project, and they all need the same version of all of these dependencies. And you need to ensure the project gets deployed to development, to UAT, and your production environment with the same versions of each dependencies. And you end up with this sort of dependency hell type situation. And you've got lots of dependencies, lots of developers, lots of environments, and you need to define them all in one place. You need to figure out how to make sure that every deployment of your application always has access to the same versions of all of these dependencies. So how do you manifest that? Or how do you ensure that happens? Well, the answer is a tool called Maven. Apache Maven is a build system and dependency management tool, and probably the most well-known one for Java. Developers simply specify the dependent libraries and their versions in an XML file called a POM file. And IDEs interpret this at dev time and download all of the required packages. And I'm going to show you exactly how to do that in a few moments' time. Maven also executes builds and understands how to correctly package all of these dependencies into one deployable unit, which you can deploy to all of your developer machines, but perhaps more importantly, across all of your environments. So a couple of important notes about Maven. Maven downloads dependencies by default from something called Maven Central, which is a large central repository of common dependencies, such as Spring, Google SDK, etc., the ones we've been talking about. Download dependencies then get cached on the local file system and are automatically pulled into the project at build time. And Maven has a really powerful command line interface, which is super useful for building projects, running tests, reloading dependencies, and cleaning out compile caches. The POM file itself simply defines the dependencies, the plugins, and the build process that's to be executed. Maven also defines a specific project structure which you need to conform to in order for it to work correctly. And this is actually quite common now across the Java ecosystem. Maven has become so, so important to Java projects that people tend to just follow this project structure by default. And you'll notice if you look at the sample code that I've given you, it also follows this project structure. So code should always live in slash source slash main slash Java. Project resources should live in slash source slash main slash resources. So that's where you put text files and things that you're going to pass, config items, etc. Tests should live in slash source slash test slash Java. And test resources should live in slash source slash test slash resources. And of course, then the pom.xml file that defines all of this configuration 
goes in the root of the project directory. And again, if you look at the code samples I've given you, you'll notice that they have a POM file in the root directory of the project. Maven dependencies can get really, really complicated. Imagine your project depends on other projects, and of course those projects also depend on yet more projects. So we end up with this very, very complicated graph of interdependent versions of things that need to be managed. Maven manages dependencies using a tree, and it's really important to understand how this works, given that sometimes dependencies further up the tree can conflict with local project dependencies. If you go to the command line, you can actually run the maven dependency tree command, and it will print out the dependencies in the current tree. It's also possible to explicitly exclude dependencies in the POM file. Now, if we look at this graph on the left-hand side here, we can see an example, a pretty common example, of when a dependency conflict might occur. Imagine we have a Java application called Test Scratch. That application depends on DB unit and Spring Core. Now, unbeknown to us, DB unit also um, also depends on J unit, J unit add-ons, POI, Apache Commons collections, Apache Commons language, and Apache Commons logging. Now, unfortunately, Spring Core also depends on Apache Commons logging. So we have two dependencies that both require the Apache Commons logging library. Now, unfortunately, Maven will just pick the closest one in the tree for your project, so the one with the least number of hops. Now, unfortunately, that's actually, in both cases, two hops to Commons logging. So if one version of Commons logging is older than another, say, for example, the one in DB unit is version 1 and in Spring Core is version 2, there might be a breaking interface change from 1 till 2. This means that when DB unit tries to log something, it finds that the interface for that method has changed and the application is going to fail. So if this is older and there is a breaking API change that another framework depends on, this can cause runtime problems. So what does a POM file look like? Well, this is an example of a POM file, and I don't want you to worry too much about all of this stuff at the top here, but the key things are the ones I've highlighted in red. So at the top here, we have the definition for the project, and this can be actually be used as a dependency for another project. So what we have to define are group ID, artifact ID, version, packaging, and name. So group ID would be uh, com dot James Cross dot whatever. Artifact ID would be the name of the artifact that you want to build. And then the name is just the name of the project. Now version is very, very important. And you'll notice here, this is called snapshot. Now snapshot is basically just used when you have a local release version. So if you're playing around with your project, with a release version of a project, it's common to put snapshot on the end, and this just signifies that you're only building it locally. And packaging is basically so Maven knows what to do when you compile it. Now, don't worry too much about a war file, but the common thing, common two fields, that are common two options you might put in here are POM, which just means you're building a Maven project, and JAR, which means you want to compile into an executable JAR file at the end. We can also define our build target name. So this is just to tell Maven what to name your um, your artifact when it's built. Then at the bottom here, perhaps most interestingly of all, we have a list of dependencies. And we can see for this project, we depend on JUnit. And you'll notice that again, that dependency is defined by group, artifact, and version. And the last interesting thing here is scope. So if we set scope to test, that tells Maven that we should only pull that dependency in when we're running a test, which means the class path won't get polluted at runtime unless we're running a test. So that's everything I wanted to show you in this video. We've had a look at dependency management. We now understand why dependency management is really important, and we've introduced ourselves to Maven.